Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Lab. My name is Zan Zerbel, and for anyone who's new to the lab, this is where we have conversations with a wide range of adventurous individuals to educate, stoke, and inspire. Your hosts today are Marshall Yanzik and myself. We will be talking with Stein and Thor Retzliff about their ski mountaineering film, Area 11, Adventuring as Siblings, and their latest ski mountaineering project in South America. So with that, let the show begin. Stein Retzliff is an ISAX expedition ski guide. He's spent the last eight months of the last three years uh, on expeditions above the Arctic Circle, working alongside explorers, visual artists, conservationists, uh, and scientists as well. <clears throat> He's been training as a polar explorer under Doug Stoop and is en route to becoming an international polar ski guide to lead skiing expeditions in the northernmost mountain ranges in the world and ski off the summits of 6,000 meter peaks in Peru. His polar expedition experience also includes Svalbard, Baffin Island, and the Northwest and Northeast Passage, as well as the Arctic Ocean and Antarctica. Thor Retzliff, the younger brother, is a dedicated, energetic adventurer. He's rooted in entrepreneurship, activism, and purposeful expedition storytelling. For the last two years, Thor has been honing his media skills in remote locations like Antarctica, the Arctic, the Amazon, Patagonia, Peru, you name it. Uh, in October 2019, he was the lead producer on their short film we'll get to later, Corcovado, um, in which a four-man team successfully pioneered a first ski descent down the sharp Patagonian volcano. Thor is pas Thor's passion is driven by the experience in wild environments, and the inconvenient value found in these regions manifests natural creativity that he strives to translate through storytelling. <clears throat> these two are here to share with us some outstanding stories about their latest film uh, about ski mountaineering expedition in Arctic called Area 11. If you haven't seen this film, it's a must watch. You can find it in the link in our event page. Uh, they'll also be sharing some insights of adventuring as siblings together. And we're gonna get a first look into their latest ski mountaineering project with Eric Ropkai and Raphael Peace uh, in South America. Can't wait to hear from these inspiring and visionary duo and hear what they have to say. So let's dive in. Floor is yours, Marshall. Let's go. Stoke has never been bigger Woo! on the show. Yeah. Hey, Stein, Thor, give us a shout out so that everybody can see you. Hey, there we are. Yeah. Yes, nice yes. Hey, uh, where are you right now? We're currently in Minnesota for the first time ever. We're exploring oh, yeah, in our Minnesota. backyard. <laughs> Minnesota to Tahoe to the Northwest to Eastern Oregon. I mean, you're kind of all over the place. Where do you call home for yourselves? We're both uh, born and raised in Truckee, California. And we've known Zan, Mr. Zan Zerbel and his family for, oh, who knows? On. We actually used to wear your clothes. I ski in your old ski jacket. Ski in my skis. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome, guys. We're super excited to have you on. I got the opportunity to chat with you both yesterday a little bit and, and get to know you better. You're young in years, but you're you're very old and wise in experience. And Zan's bios about you are spot on. There's endless that we could dive into tonight, and unfortunately, we only get you for about an hour and. Uh, we'll dive into a few of the topics, but I'd urge those that are on the show tonight to to look these guys up, man. They're they're really, really inspiring guys, and they're surrounded by very inspiring people. And they're not just adventurers. They do a lot of things that are that are inspiring to all. So it's, it's a great to have you guys. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, so thanks for joining us tonight. Many, many um, thanks. Of course, of course. Let's dive right into it. Many of our questions will be centered around this. Area 11 was a recent project for you guys, skiing unknown remote coolers of the Arctic. Uh, not a whole lot of people travel there. Uh, not a lot, of whole people, a lot of people think to even go there or have the desire to go there, but you guys did. Yeah. I want to ask you guys, what was the inspiration behind this adventure and then what became a, a film for you? Well, uh, we went to school in Portland, Oregon, actually, for four years. We went to Lewis and Clark College, and Portland is where a lot of, it's where a lot of this actually started. So Portland has been very much an integral part of where we began, and going to the inspiration around Area 11, we were going into our senior year at Lewis and Clark College uh, when we went up to uh, Whistler, Canada, and we did a little ski bomb trip. So we were living in an RV, and uh, pretty much we, we were skiing and ran into a guy on a chairlift who turned out to be a polar explorer who's skied the North and South Poles more than anyone in the history of the planet. His name's Doug Staup, and he turned out to be an immediate 
uh, mentor figure for us. Um, he, he's like, what do you guys want to do with your life? And we told him we wanted to become ski mountaineers and we wanted to climb mountains and pretty much create stories around the world. And he's like, well, if you're going to be the next generation of explorers or adventurers, you have to add purpose to what you're doing. So you can climb to whatever mountaintop you, you want and you can take a photo or a selfie and beat your chest, say how cool you are, but you're going to have to add, take it a step further in order to become a little bit more purposeful and fulfilling as you move forward in this life. So that's kind of what we wanted to do. And earlier in that time, we asked him four years ago, where on earth is your favorite place to ski? And Doug responded, there's this little known mountain range in the middle of the Arctic on an island north of Norway. So that's where this picture is. And this is called Svalbard. So when we first were talking to Doug, it was actually the first project that he went to. We were like, hey, he's like, I'm about to go on an expedition. I'm going to this place called Svalbard. And my best friend and Eric and then Thor and I were like, what on earth is Svalbard? What is Svalbard? Yeah, like, what is that place? That sounds like weird. And uh, we pretty much looked it up and it's just this tiny little island north of Norway in like the middle of nowhere. He literally said it was Valhalla of skiing. And that was like, really? You've skied the North and South Poles more than anyone in the history of the planet. He runs the company Ice Axe to any pioneered skiing on the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula and the Arctic, like everywhere in these remote environments. Like, and the best place you've ever skied is this the northernmost mountain range of the world. We're like, damn, this place sounds like magical. So for the last few years, we've been dreaming of visiting this place and really bringing like that experience back to our families and friends and everyone who is willing to hear it. So last spring, the timing was a little bit right. We had been training for years uh, following Doug. He did a couple different South Pole and North Pole trips. We've been observing his techniques and skill set. And we've been just training really hard and understanding the importance of preparation. And uh, we talked to a few different mentors, a French polar explorer, and yeah, all of these different things. And once we, uh, once we figured out how to get out there, it was time for us to uh, leave on a flight to go out, out get out to Longubin, which is the northernmost airport of the world. And we landed and we did about an eight-day polar training course with Doug which was also quite interesting. Okay, so like a little bit of a side note. North Pole <laughs> season was last year canceled for the first time in 20 years. And then this is the second year it's been canceled. And last year, Doug, the North Pole season kept getting pushed back. So Doug pretty much, he's, he called Thor and I up. He's like, hey, um, North, I might have to do this expedition to the North Pole. You guys might have to teach this polar training course. And we're like, really? Like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. So we... We, we did a bunch of Skypes with Doug, and then Thor and I were just, like, diving in heavy on polar training. Like, like you're reading a 25-page document on how to pretty much avoid polar bears, and if a polar bear were to come to you, like, the necessary precautions of what to do. And we're like, Jesus. Like, like doing polar training in the Squaw Valley we, we, we have five yeah. clients who are like, I'm, I was 24 at the time, Thor was 22 or 23. <laughs> like, all right, welcome to this polar training course taught by master polar explorer <laughs> Doug Stout. Uh, it was currently on the North Pole. So we pretty much were, we did many, many polar training courses before that to even get to the point where we felt comfortable teaching it. So many years of experience, many, many months of planning have led us to, once we completed the polar training course, which Doug did happen to go on because North Pole season was canceled, we pretty much told Doug and it was time for us to go try and find this like magical place called Valhalla. And that is a long, long story short on how Doug like mentored us in this crazy, crazy whirlwind of wanting to create these remote expedition stories. Mm -hmm. And that was the inspiration around us as brothers wanting to go test these years of mentorship and polar skills and training yeah. in one of the most remote environments on earth. Yeah. And Thor can speak to his. I, th I think even taking a step back further, like look at the photo in front of us, this line right here, Stein skied that. And it's one of those things where growing up in Squaw Valley and looking up to our parents who are both professional skiers at one point in their life, us being the children of those parents, like I've always aspired to be some kind of skier. You know, I was built a racer, didn't really race. I got into park skiing, didn't do park skiing, but it's always this thing about skiing that has enticed both of us to pursue that thrill. And I think that was a very much an underlying passion for both of us is to explore those kind of ski trains and then once that kind of developed into Doug 
pointing us down this path of saying, listen, like there's this place in Svalbard, the skiing will blow your mind. And we got our minds blown. So, so you guys mentioned Doug a lot. Who, uh, can you explain to everybody who Doug is? Yeah. So, I mean, you, one, you never know who you're going to meet on a chairlift ever. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> The, the sheer awareness of opportunity is mm -hmm. quite wild. So just like I could not emphasize it enough, the, the truth behind learning and growing and doing your research and just asking questions is so important because if it weren't for meeting Doug and kind of like we were serious bums, we were living in a, we were living in a little 84 Sun Raider with five, six people. And he, <laughs> Doug actually told us, he's like, you guys smell really bad. Um, <laughs> if you, if before you go out to the bars or whatever, like here's a room key, go shower up in like the Fairmont Chateau, which is like the nice of the nice hotels. And uh, pretty much he, he's like, he's this really, he's known as Malibu Doug. Like his story is insane. Like Sylvester Stallone's private trainer. He was on uh, Baywatch. What was Baywatch. Like <laughs> a crazy, Baywatch. crazy story with this guy. And like he was, he had a Squaw Valley sticker on his helmet. That's kind of what started this, the conversation. And we're like, are you from Squaw? And he's like, yeah, I live in school. I ski like 300 days a year all over the world. But like, what? Like, how's that? Like, how do we do what you do? And he's like, well, it's really not that easy. And he has this wild. He was, he was like, one of, him and his buddy, they played for West, I think it was West Virginia. West Virginia but him and his buddy were the first two Americans ever drafted to play professional soccer in Europe. So like, it, it, like his story can go on and on and on. But he skied the North and South Poles more than anyone in the history of the planet. I think he's been he's been to Antarctica 50 times skiing, uh, North Pole like 20 times, um, and then runs the company Ice Axe Expeditions. Where if you wanna if you if you're interested to again do a little bit of your due diligence and understand a lot of these places around the world that you can ski, it, it's one of those amazing sources that you're like wow you could ski in the Atlas Mountains. It's pretty much if you want to do remote skiing, backcountry skiing, and mostly human powered skiing on all seven continents, Doug has probably been there. Yeah. So, so Doug's, a, Doug's a pretty powerful mentor for you. You got him for a minute on a chairlift and you convinced him to, to bring you under your wing, under his wing, and, and, and bring you along in this, this crazy world of Arctic exploration. Amazing. The other one I'd like to touch on is adventure with purpose. Fill us in a little bit more about what that means to you guys and, and, and how that's inspiring everything that you are doing in the adventurous world now. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a stab at it and then Thor can fill in the blank. But one of the things that we really wanted to do and one of the things that Doug had done is his first time skiing the South Pole, he brought a blind and a deaf guy to the South Pole at the same time, which is like two, two separate people. Just separate crazy. People. Yeah, yeah, two separate people. <laughs> like logistically, like think about that. Like you're in a minus 40 minus to minus 60 degree environment trying to like it, – it, it's insane. But he – well, he's like, I can, I can, I've been to these environments. Like, what's the why? Like, why am I going to these places? And he wanted to make a note on being like, you can, like, he has no real purpose of being there. So like, what is his purpose? And he brought handicapped people and he uh, really wanted to see people fulfill their dreams, then raise money for charities. So that he inspired us to reach out a bunch of nonprofits. And we had this we wrote this white, white paper in college on how to change the world with social media, um, which was kind of a means to an end for us just trying to be a little bit more creative in order to go create stories in remote environments. So we worked with 13 different international nonprofits, did a lot of the remote expedition storytelling, and then mostly told through social and then ran different campaigns. So a lot of our work for many years has been nonprofit focused and purpose as like the overarching con like concept of the entire thing. And if you want to speak to the purpose. Yeah. I, I mean, to add on to that, you know, adventuring with purpose, being able to tell a story, one that Stein and I actually listened to on Audible while we we're stuck in our tent for 30 hours plus with Shackleton's yeah. endurance, right? And so being able to tell these stories, these narratives that empower young adventurers and other people alike is something that we can now do with, you know, our iPhones. Everyone's now a producer. Everyone can go out and tell a story. And so, where that leads you is the ability to influence and tell an impactful story. And so Stein and I recognizing the, the fact that we can now create a story through a visual medium, we need to have a higher purpose that drives some kind of deeper narrative to the audience. It's not just us skiing 
people have been skiing for a long time now. There's really cool ski videos. I'm not the best skier. Stein's not the best skier. But what we can do is add another level of purpose to that so that people can kind of see past and find a deeper value there. And that's like the whole idea of expedition with purpose is we're telling a story, you're relating to it, you're enticed by the actual adventure, like, you know, highest mountain range in the world, and then you can pull out some deeper from that. Yeah, that, that's actually just a quick note. That's a great point that Thor just brought up is we, like with our, be with our best friend, Eric, like we had these, like I'm an economics major, Thor is a sociology major, and Eric's a philosophy major. So we have just this like hodgepodge of just random majors. <laughs> What is that? Coming together. I don't and my, know. I, my mom was mad that I didn't have a minor from college. So I wrote down international entrepreneurship. <laughs> like, they accepted, so like, she got happy and whatever. But we, uh, we pretty much were like, okay, so what makes us unique? We're not the best climbers in the world. We sure the hell are not the best filmmakers in the world. And we're not the best like skiers. So we like knew that we're not the best at like any of these things. So what is kind of what, what's something that we can make us unique? And it was like, pretty much just being on the forefront of how fast social media was moving and like, okay, we'll just create, we'll, we'll get, we'll kind of create a buffer for us to learn how to do all these things by jumping on social media yeah. and just like doing it and creating yeah. as much content and as many, many of these stories as possible in order to now like we have cameras, but it, it gave us a great buffer on being yeah. able to like set ourselves up to actually share something like Area 11. Yeah. And this is a good use case, honestly. Like being able yeah. to chat with you guys and we'll get into World yeah. Tree, we'll get into our nonprofit, but being able to show you the purpose yeah. that we've yeah. manifested through this. Yeah. So. And, and we're, 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 we've never done, we didn't go to film school. I didn't get a camera until two years after graduating college, just a couple of years ago. Um, so like we're not professional filmmakers or photographers by any means. We're just... Passionate. Like throwing shit at a wall. Oh, sorry for my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I, I think that's that these are these are uh, just fabulous, fabulous things that you guys are standing for and, and bringing to light. And it's the next generation of adventures, and, and you guys are on the forefront of that. And it's it's just it's awesome to see it happening. And with do good shit, your your nonprofit, and then Team Intrepid. Um, so okay, we're gonna we're gonna shift gears a little bit. We're gonna get we're gonna get back to Area Eleven, uh, and we're gonna dive into the actual skiing at area in in that zone for you uh talk to us a little bit about what the skiing was like in this like isolated remote kind of dr dreamland at one point for you and, and that skiing for you so uh if i may start if i can just start by like getting out there um it was ridiculous um it was a 140 mile snowmobile ride that took 12 hours and it's just like the environment's changing so rapidly we loaded up enough fuel to last us there and back and hopefully a little bit extra. But we, on our, a couple hours in, we actually, it's like, it, it's tough to get to. A couple hours in, we saw on this little crest, uh, this shovel waving in the air. And I, um, I mean, we could show a picture. I can bring up a picture when Thor's talking, but we saw this team and we're like, oh, that's kind of odd. So kind of pull out of the way, drop the sledges off, um, Thor, Thor and we were with a photographer, Aaron Hogue, and we brought her to the side and pretty much I went to go check them out and I pulled over and they're French and between like a series of just like gibberish and hand signals, uh, we came to find out and soon realized that their snowmobile with a sledge was hanging by its two skis of above a 60 foot crevasse that was about 10 feet wide. And we're like, I was, I walked up to them. I'm like, okay. Are you okay? And we're like, I, I can't speak French. <laughs> and like, like, it was very tough to communicate. But pretty much after a while, like everyone was okay. They had called the governor's fall bar. Like, can you helicopter our snowmobile out? They're like, are you? Is everyone fine? They're like, yeah. They're like, well, we're not gonna lift a snowmobile out just for the fun of it. So um, that was kind of the beginning. And then we had to dodge four or five different crevasse fields on the way out there. And then we had to change the route three different times. Uh -huh. So it was like a lot of serious glacier navigation and uh, lots of like crevasse management. So it was not easy to get out there. But once we got out there, I remember when we entered and we found that we were there, it was gnarly storms. Like our faces, not even kidding, were just like raw like leather for weeks. Mm -hmm. And just because of the wind and it's minus 30 and you're just like, like your eyes are just bloodshot red. And you're like, I can't believe. But like once we entered and we saw these peaks, 
Like I definitely teared up because we're like, damn, it has been 11 hours of mobbing through this gnarly environment. And we have finally like reached this place. That's like, it was Valhalla. Like it was unreal. And once we got there, it was like window shopping. You're like, well, that place has probably never been touched by a ski. Like no one's out here. You're like in one of the most remote places on earth. Like uh, for a while, like, and we talked to Doug, like we were probably the northernmost people in the world at that time of year, just because North Pole season wasn't happening. And it was like, it was, the skiing was amazing. And this stuff, this snow is just like 50,000 years old. Like it is mm-hmm. unreal. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Thor, how about you skiing for you in that such an isolated? I think that the snow's different. I don't know why, what come to my mind is the indigenous societies and people that live in Arctic regions, they have more than a hundred words for snow and be able to experience one of those kinds of snow that you don't find in the Sierra Nevada snowpack or even Portland or, you know, skiing that Arctic snow and finding your way down six inches of perfect buff down cool eyes like that is one of those things where you're making your turns, you're like in your rhythm. And you're fully aware that you are so out there that it's a surreal experience, honestly. And knowing that your brother is like across the yeah. <clears throat> way over there about the ski line that no one's even looked at. And you just get to the bottom and the stoke is just so alive and real. And, yeah. you know, and, and skiing does that to me at, you know, the mountain running squaw. But being able to translate that into this Arctic environment is just unparalleled, honestly. Like, yeah. Just looking at this photo, you can see, I mean, if – if, you, if, if you're in your backyard and you're kind of looking at topo maps or just taking photos and be like, oh, is that skiable or whatnot, just looking at this photo on the screen, just looking off <laughs> in the distance, you're like, oh, what? Like, that one looks rad. But it really sets you back in terms of like a safety perspective of like, if you get hurt, you're like screwed. That's a big so one. So you're, you're really having, you can ski at like 40%. Like you're, you're not wanting to do anything super hardcore because you're going to have, you're like a helicopter away. Like you're a long helicopter away from even getting to long year bin, which doesn't even really have a hospital. And then you have to go to the mainland. It is a serious process of getting out. And so like you have to tone it back when you're in such crazy environments. Yeah. So, so you kind of alluded to there, you, 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 you haven't toned it back. It's your first glimpse at this, this Valhalla. Uh, you're, you're finally there, you're skiing. Um, is there anything that you guys saw that you say, I, I got to go back to, to Valhalla to ski that? Is there anything there that, that stood out to you guys? Probably about a hundred of them. Almost every <laughs> <laughs> this, this one. Of those, I mean, talk about a young kid walking into a candy shop and saying, I, I could eat everything right now. Yeah. But the, the cool thing I'm going to note on right now is the 24-hour sun. Yeah. And because there's a 24-hour sun, yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of stuff to do with that. But, like, let's say we spot a cooler on our way in. I remember just, like, looking left, looking right, like, I want to ski that, I want to ski that. And so you can track that, understand what aspect it's at, and say, listen, I'm going to ski that from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., mm-hmm. and I'm going to have perfect sunlight. So you start hiking at 1.30 a.m., get to the top, and you're skiing in, like, this – incredible low horizon light and you would it would never touch that aspect in you know north america and so like those kinds of things that we can get better at calculating Mm -hmm. i mean i think of this really steep Mm -hmm. trident like line this time i want to ski but it was pretty exposed going back and hitting those kind of lines again would be spectacular and and you have no beta for any of these places there's no avalanche forecast center you're like okay well I had some avalanche training, like a lot more avalanche training now, but it was like at the time, we're like, oh, uh, like, uh, should we, is that like, is that fine? Like, are we going to be okay skiing that? And that last photo of that couloir was, I mean, that was the place that Doug had showed us. He's like, this is, this is called the Trident. We're like, and we found that, ra- another side story, found this like really randomly just because we were stuck in this bowl. Like, you can see a little bit of our snowmobile tracks. We, I posted a video to YouTube about us getting stuck in there and then having to find an alternative route where I turned around and I'm like, holy well, smokes, we're stuck. that's that Coulard Doug was talking about. And we, if you can see a little shady, I was uh, almost at the top during this, but you climb in the shade because the snow gets really soft. So you, you have to time things like with the sun because it's just going around in circles. 
So you climb up the shady part to gain a little bit more purchase. And I was up to my chest. It was about 50, it was like 52 degrees for most of it. And the top was closer to like 58 degrees. So I'm like standing in and like pretty much just like poking at it just with my chest. And you have to go up the shade. And then I sat at the top of the couloir. Thor took this photo, skiing this other really rad line, but sat up there for an hour just waiting for the sun to cover the rest of the couloir, which turned out to be 10.30 p.m. So it was like everything was based on sunlight. That's, that sounds amazing. So I, I mean, we're so, we're so uh, dictated by our, our skiing hours here by the sunlight. So that kind of takes me to my next question and kind of transitioning a little bit, a little bit away from the, the skiing per se, but more to kind of what it was like just to, I mean, you're living out there and it's two, two weeks, right? You're out there two weeks, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, you got this 24 hours of sunlight. Talk to us a little bit about what it was like to live in a, a tent like this with 24 hours of sunlight, having to gain rest and then go out and adventure the next day again. I'll talk about the camping. If you want to talk about the gear, like charging stuff. Um, so we experienced storms 50% of the time. Um, it wasn't bluebird and amazing weather. The like <laughs> every day, <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, we pretty much were experiencing minus 40 degree temps. Um, and then it was coming up to some of the wind gusts were up to 65 miles an hour and things are just shaking. If you can see that bag to the right, that's our food bag. So, I mean, applying some of the skills that Doug taught us, uh, just because we're in polar bear country, you have to ski with a rifle. You literally cannot leave the town of Long Yubin without having a rifle. And then, uh, then we had a couple of flare guns. It's, it's the law cause you're going out in polar bear country. So we situated ourselves up on this little ridge line where all of our food is about 10 meters downwind of us. So we had these two tents set up here. This is actually the gear tent, Thor will talk a little bit more about that. But because we knew that timing was so short and like I wish we could be up there for a lot longer, but we wanted to be skiing as much as we could. So <clears throat> I actually set my alarm every 45 minutes. So every, single, every 45 minutes I would wake up and go outside to shovel off the valences, make sure sometimes the, the wind was shifting so much so we had to adjust the snowmobiles and create these perimeters. So like these snowmobiles, we'd pretty much just create these snow walls constantly around us. So it was like constantly every hour getting outside, making sure like, is it sunny? And there's many times where we just like, all right, well, it looks like it's breaking. Let's start boiling water. It takes like an hour to boil enough water for breakfast, maybe like two hours for dinner. So you're just like, a lot of their time is just literally watching snow melt. Like that is a lot of what this is. And you're like, oh God, like it, it turned into a really great activity. And you're just like wanting to get out there and ski, but you literally can't. Mother nature is too powerful yeah. and has the upper hand in every situation. And you're just trying to live. You're like, we were warm and cozy, just sharing stories or just staring blankly in space. But Thor can talk about the gear tent. Yeah, so you get two tents get a little bit more technical with what it's like to camp in polar environments. Two tents, we cook and we live in, we'll call it the living tent. And so when you're cooking, you got this vestibule and you can picture two layers of the tent, the outside layer, and then there's a more inside layer. And that inside layer is one in itself. And then the outside layer is what you cook in. So imagine if you are steaming your broccoli and you get a bunch of steam up into your house, nothing really happens. That same thing happens inside of a tent Mind you, inside of the tent where you're sleeping, all of that steam is going to immediately freeze either at the top of your tent or in the air. Now you got wet sleeping bags, now you got wet clothing, now you got wet this or that. You're not going to get dry. And so it's one of those things where right when your 45 minute snow boil starts to happen, you have to quickly zip up the inside of the vestibule, let the air, the steam go out through the tent, and manage that very meticulously or else you're going to deal with wet clothing. And so it's the small technical type things that we had to be super conscious of while living in this tent. Another thing is, this is our media tent here. And you can't see it, but on the other side of this, we've got two solar panels hanging. And I swear, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life is tried to keep batteries warm to film stuff in the Arctic. Like I had six <laughs> pockets on me, like big 800 down Big 800 down jacket, and I had like drone battery here, drone charger here, GH5 battery, pocket Osmo, and you had to keep everything warm because if you were to turn a battery on when it's really cold, it would zap, zap, like completely go out. 
mind you, charging an entire – we use Goal Zeros, mm-hmm. which are excellent, great, great chargers. Um, we would charge up an entire Goal Zero, and that would give us, like, one drone mm-hmm. battery. And that was, like, very valuable life to capture ski runs and whatnot. And so making sure that everything was very organized in here, we would use um, hand warmers. Yeah. We had like all these different techniques to just, like keep our stuff warm so that we could then jump out into the field right when the sun hit or something like that. Yeah. If you, a, a trick, phones die all the time in the cold, as many of us know who like to explore in snowy weather. So on all of our power banks, our phones, we would put a toe, adhesive toe warmer <laughs> and slap it to the back of our phones and power banks. And that kept things warm and going. And regardless of how bad your boots smell, like if you, like my, my personal liners have like actually smell like death, like they're terrible. Um, but you have to sleep with your boot liner in your bag. And it's like, because when, <laughs> one, one morning, <laughs> it's not in the film, but Thor left, like, I don't know what happened. It's not Thor's fault. But like my boots were left outside. <laughs> I literally could not get them in. Huh. So you, you, so it just, it sounds like it's, you're constantly, even, even when you're not skiing, you're constantly doing something around camp to, to, to realistically stay alive. Um, talk to us for those that are listening in and myself, like I, I'm just intrigued. Like what, what, what does that time spent look like in your tent? Like, what are you doing there? That those hours that you're not sleeping, that I can't imagine it's easy to get sleep in minus 40 degree weather, but so uh, I mean, this is, this is not the finest photo of me, but uh, I have a pretty nice snot stickle going. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you, I mean, you're disconnected from everything, but that's also what makes everyone mm-hmm. a little bit closer inside the tent. You, like, we each brought a book. Audible is incredibly helpful, but we have journals. Um, I don't have them with me right now, but we, we journal. You write what's your what you're doing like any ideas or projects you just have a lot of time to just think and really uh, kind of explore your mind and just like absolute solitude so mm-hmm. you write we chatted about nonprofit media for hours you know or you boil water for hours like you just like yeah. doing whatever you can listening reading just trying to like figure out it's it's quite a unique place though in that tent mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think you know, to take that depth, a step further is realizing that at the end of it, we're all pretty simple beings and being in a quiet, windy place, you don't really need stimulation always. You yeah. can sit yeah. there and seriously watch water boil and be very content and with yourself and in tune with the environment and know you're thinking ahead of what's going on. And being able to get to that point takes two days trapped in the tent might take three or four, but it's like one of those things where you practice that and you get to that point. It's, I think it's a very meditative and powerful experience. I could not reemphasize and affirm what Thor just said like anymore, but within this age of distractions and so many things happening and notifications and like, am I doing this? Am I doing this? Like, Oh, well, I have all these, like just being outside as you all know, and everyone who's watching like you, the, the ability to ha- find peace in like solitude is such an important trait yeah. and it allows you to like legitimately meditate and think. So it's like a breath of really fresh cold air when you're just sitting in that tent. Cold air. For sure. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds uh, kind of refreshing in a lot of ways. You're, you're, you're there to live and, and to live simply and, and to, to ski the next day. And that's, that sounds amazing. It sounds awesome right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> So I, I got to ask, okay, so it, it's, you got tent living. Uh, this, this next question I think comes from a little inside source who, who, who may be on, on panel with us right now, uh, Zan, uh, who knows you pretty well. Sounds like you guys uh, pulled a, a naked spread eagle in, in tribute of Shane McConkey. Uh, and I think for those on the call, like, we got to know, how, how cold was that really? Naked in the Arctic? <laughs> That was quite the day. Um, like that was that was a, that was a highlight of the trip. We <laughs> we so Erin, she's an incredible photographer. Mad respect for her. We another side story, but like we didn't, really, we didn't know. Like was introduced to her via another mentor, Christina Mittermeier, before the trip, and she's very very talented. And she was doing this uh, 
kind of scene, like uh, getting the shot. <laughs> and we're, we're like, That's, we wanted to like being that we're, I mean, Shane McConkie is a huge inspiration for us. Yeah. We wanted to uh, kind of add a little bit of fun mix up to like, I mean, yes, polar expeditions are incredibly serious and dialed. But when you're with your like brother, you're like, yeah, how do we, like, I, I'm not trying to impress you. Like, I mean, kind of like it, was, it wasn't really a goal. I didn't really care if Thor was impressed with me or not. But like, we were like, okay, how do we take this up? And side note, we're going back and we had a lot of things up, uh, ideas up our sleeve that we wrote down out there that we didn't, weren't able to do. But one of the biggest things like was let's build a kicker, which I could almost, Confidently. almost nearly guarantee that no one's ever built a kicker out there. Like, of course, proper booting. And we each threw backflips. And then towards the end of it, I look at them I'm like, I think, I think now's the time. Like, I think I'm just going to try a naked spread eagle. And we had just climbed a couple of cool R's that morning, and it was rad. And I mean, it wasn't like that cold. I think it was like minus 10. And we were like, okay, like, let's, uh, let's figure it out. And it took hours to build this jump. The snow is like, the moisture just gets ripped out of the snow. So there's no real like density to it. So you're just like pile on. It took hours to build the thing. So <laughs> taking off the clothes was definitely the tough part. But uh, yeah, once <laughs> once it started, it wasn't gonna like stop. My my spread eagle could have definitely been a little bit better, but uh, it it wasn't like the time where I wanted to show off or again impress Thor or Aaron, yeah. who's we just met like a week before, and I was like, oh, I'm new. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, that was that was a fun day. And then we then if you saw on the video the uh, Infinity Eights, that was after that. So that day we had skied a, a couple f- different couloirs. Sixteen hour day. Yeah, we had skied. Yeah, almost like nearly seventeen hours, and it was it was an amazing day. Uh, side note: I'd like to call out that you guys just like blew right over. Oh, it's not that cold of a day. It's minus ten out. Oh. Not that cold. Well, relatively. Just, I, I, I just want to reiterate that. Like that, that's <laughs> perception of cold to you guys is a different different level in this scenario. <laughs> um, so before we before we start to transition a, li- uh, a little ways away from from Area Eleven, and um, I want to ask most memorable moment on this trip for you guys. What was it? Oh, God, that's a that's a really tough question because. We accomplished a few different things that we really set out there to do. Uh, the ultimate one was finding the place. Um, that was an absolute highlight, like made me tear up. Finding that couloir randomly was amazing, but honestly just being able and having the sheer opportunity to get out there and then ski, like not only ski, because some people get blown out with storms the entire time. So our ability to know how to camp, and ski and somehow miraculously put together a film about it highlight for sure like no idea how that like came together but honestly the highlight for me is like somehow it came together like we found the place we were able to put our skis on one at least once and then we were able to come back with a little bit of media to share with viewers like you and like friends and fellow adventurers and things like that. So that was probably my highlight. It's like it actually freaking worked. Yeah. And yeah, I'd say it's most memorable. Stein alluded to it, but driving, excuse me, snowmobiling into Valhalla, that in Fiala for the first time, with a foot of powder on both sides of you and like steep couloirs just running on both sides of your face. It's it's an experience I'll never forget. But I had this one very distinct moment where that razor coolar a couple sides back stein was hiking that my goal was to ski this other coolar adjacent to him and as i was hiking up it was like approaching 9 p.m and i was just hiking i was sweating and you know i was working out and i was thinking back to training for the adam fiella and then putting myself right into the experience i remember pausing and looking around and really finding like absolute like peace and like gratitude for being in that place and like like I remember telling myself to like capture that moment and like to this day I remember that moment very well as I hiked the rest up and had the best turns I had the whole time down and then I filmed Stun skiing a thousand meter three thousand foot couloir and it was like that was a very memorable experience for me so it's fun to be there with family like experiencing things like that with the people you love is unparalleled yeah
I love it. Man, it's, it's pretty powerful to hear you guys talk about it too. And, and uh, it's, it's neat. Um, so we're going to touch on this quickly for uh, so aligning with your ethos, we're going back to this adventure with purpose. So on this trip, uh, it's, it sounds like you guys partnered with the World Tree Eco Program to offset your carbon footprint. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like that whole piece of this trip on top of the actual expedition itself? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, to make another long story short, <laughs> I feel like we have to repeat that all the time. I feel uh, like we, we could have stories all day with you guys in like seven <laughs> different episodes. Just, just <laughs> this, so keep going. So, yeah. We were working with an amazing nonprofit called Sea Legacy with some of the most talented visual conservation artists in the world, like Paul Nicklin and Christina Mittermeier. And we worked with them for a couple of years and did a lot of their expedition storytelling. And they're like mad respect to those two. But we had this globe form and found and pretty much were introduced to this World Tree program. And we knew, we, we tried at the beginning, we tried to model Borga Ausland, another famous polar explorer, and Vincent Colliard. Uh, we tried to model a little bit of their project called Ice Legacy, where they collect black carbon from 20 of the world's largest ice caps. Amazing mission. But we wanted to, we, we tried to model it, but it was just getting too complicated. And one of the things that we wanted to do and kind of set a standard for future expeditions was, I mean, we, we it's, it's like protect our winners. It's all imperfect advocacy um, for us because they're, our main purpose for this trip was like, what, what, like one, testing and really putting our skills of years of mentorship to the test from Dub. That was our purpose. It's like inspiring people to go find, like hoping to like inspire people to find mentors. Like they're, they, they're so amazing and w their willingness to help you is incredible. But we didn't really necessarily, we weren't going out there to work with a nonprofit. We tried, but it just got a little bit too convoluted. We did like many days of work trying to get to that. And one of the things that ended up coming back to it was World Tree. They were an amazing organization who offered to sponsor a carbon offset program. So we planted one acre of empress trees, which offset actually all of our trips for last year. So that was kind of like to set a standard. Um, it wasn't to the purpose that like we really were producing a story around, but it was something that we felt needed to be like set as a standard for future projects. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's all. That's awesome, man. I, it's, most people could barely imagine to, to actually go on an Arctic expedition and actually just do that, but then to roll into all the logistics and to, to actually do something good purposeful is, is it speaks a lot to you guys and it's, it's pretty powerful. So props to you guys. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, last question on, 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 before we jump into your nonprofit quickly, uh, area 11, uh, what was, what was the name? What, where'd that come from? Geography. Uh, <laughs> so okay. these fall bars split up into a bunch of different things. If you look at their map, uh, there's area 10, which like, you know, I was like, might have, might get, like, who knows what I get in trouble for it, but like area 10. You have Long mm -hmm. Ubin, and it goes out through the Advendalen to Sassendalen, which are a bunch of Norwegian names that make real no, really no sense to anyone who's really watching unless you know Svalbard. But they're split up into different squares, like pretty much like mm -hmm. these different areas are all separated by areas. So Area 10 is where a lot of like traditional tours go. Um, for like, so, like you don't really go to the outskirts. It could be a day trip or like a very long day trip or an overnight. But to, if you enter into area 11, you're entering into like past the boundary. Act, line. Like yeah. you're already in the middle of the Arctic, like in a very remote place. But once you head in like past area 10, you're heading into area 11, which is like, like you're, you're, you're technically from like local guides and people like the government, you're entering into like fucking, sorry. Space. <laughs> You're entering in a space. <laughs> so, so, and uh, we were actually at a meeting in New York, and uh, one of our good friends, Rachel Eck, uh, we were figuring out a title, and she's like, "What about like? Didn't you say something about Area Ten and Area 11 And she's like, "Yeah, Area Eleven. Okay, that's going to be the title of the thing." So uh, that's how we got it. I love it. I love it. So, it, it, basically, we need to look at a map. Is look at yeah. a map in Area Eleven, middle of nowhere. Now you, know about, now you know what Svalbard is, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, we're, we're, we're officially going to transition a little. Um, 
So uh, before Zan takes over, I, I, we want to touch on, on do good shit. Uh, pardon my language on, on the call, but that is, that is, has, there's lots behind this that I think Thor will, Thor will dive into with us. Um, tell us about this new nonprofit that you guys have started. Uh, do good shit. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk about do good shit. Um, do good shit was actually founded by Stan and Eric. You mentioned Eric earlier on the side of Mount Everest in 2018. November 2018, and we went there. They went there to document the Everest Biogas Project and specifically the 26,000 pounds of human waste left on Mount Everest annually by climbers. And what this led us to is realizing that this human waste problem is beyond Everest. It's in Aconcagua, it's in my backyard in Tahoe, it's in Zan, it's in your backyard in Mount Hood. Realizing that there really is not a sound solution for human waste management. Mm -hmm. And so after this transmission in the field that closed off by saying, do good shit, it kind of rang in our head and we're like, that's really catchy. That's sticky. That's something that we can all kind of relate to. And thus this idea took shape in the form of what is now a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And our mission, as you can see here, is pretty much to implement human waste solutions at a global scale. Um, and what does that look like? What we've created is what we call the DGS system, and that is a top to bottom implementation of a solution, all the way from looking at your site and saying, you guys either need a pit toilet, you need to implement wag bags. Maybe, maybe, maybe a pit toilet is a solution. Who knows? But we do that all the way through maintenance in the long term. And a big part of DGS is making sure that we implement a long term solution. Um, and another thing about do good shit is we're kind of straightforward, like do good shit. I mean, how many times have you been, you know, in the field or like you stomp a backflip and your friend was like, that shit was dope, right? And so our, one of our goals is to have shit be a positive connotation rather than just our byproducts, right? And so doing good shit means that you're in the backcountry with your girlfriend and you got to go drop a deuce. We're going to make sure you're aware that you need to make, you pack that TP out because no one wants to pick that shit up, right? And we want to hold you accountable for those kind of actions. Imagine taking that on a small scale and expanding that to a global scale, saying, listen, these environments are really fragile. Everest is literally deteriorate, deteriorating because of the amount of human waste flowing from the Kumbu Valley all the way through those communities. Like fresh water, there's no more fresh water because of human waste and tourists coming and shitting on the route. So it's like those kind of things that we want to break down in a very blunt way, but do it in a very professional manner. Talk about it, Torres. Torres La Pana? Yeah, what did you do? So in the past year, we've one, got our 501c3 status, which was huge. Two, we have conducted our first project down in Torres del Pine, which is actually also known as the eighth wonder of the world. We went down there and have started the process of installing three different urine diverting toilets in this national park. And when I say there's a lot of traffic there, there is a lot of traffic at Torres del Paine. And this place needs human waste solutions. And so by the end of this year, mind you, current circumstances with COVID, but we're going to be installing and finishing those projects. Looking towards the future, we've got projects in Mount Hood, Tahoe, Everest, Peru, and Chile. And that's just kind of the beginning. Um, unfortunately, all of our projects have been canceled for this year, but we're pivoting and trying to really make sure that DGS is the human waste organization and we will implement solutions all over the world. And so it's, it's young, we're still a startup, but we also have field research. We've got a great team. Zan's been collaborating with us and we have an awesome network of people um, that are really trying to push this thing forward. It's something small, it's not something that a lot of people talk about, but as do good shit, we want to talk about it and we want to do it right, so. Yeah. And they're trademarked. We are trademarked, <laughs> yeah. do good shit. <laughs> I mean, but in, in, in real talk, like it, shit is something, shit poop is something that, that, uh, that nobody wants to talk about nor do they want to deal with, they want to leave it and it's, it's gross, right? And, and you guys with do good shit are, are heading that off around the world and it's something that we, we as adventurers and doing the right thing when we're out there need to need to take on and be be cognizant of our footprint and you guys are doing good shit yeah. um for those listening in uh how can people find you how can they find do good shit and where where's the best way to communicate and reach out to you 
So please, please, please go to dogoodshit.org. We've got a newsletter there you can sign up for. You can uh, get our contact, reach out to us. If you have ideas, if you have a poop problem in your backyard, please let us know. Um, and we got some new developments happening now. So cool. um, look forward to hearing more about Do Good Shit, honestly. So. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And, and shout out to your, your partners who aren't on the call tonight. We got uh, Taylor and Eric as well, too, who are, are very intertwined with Do Good Shit and Team Intrepid. And, uh, so shout out to them, too. So uh, you, we get the, the luxury of seeing you guys and we'll have do good shit on later for uh, an, uh, another episode to dive deeper into that. Cause there's, that's endless stories there too. So at Eric this point, I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> uh, so at this point I'm going to hand it back over to Zan. He's going to dig in uh, to kind of what's up and coming for you guys. Zan, take it away. Are we losing Zan? Zan, are you there? And Technical difficulties. All right, guys. Um, so coming soon. I'll, I'll jump in for Stan or for, for Zan, sorry. Um, tell us a little bit about um, – so you recently were, were live with the Boy Scouts. Uh, you had – I think you guys are saying thousands of people viewing. Um, again, another story, story there uh, behind, again, at your roots, doing good, doing good and adventure with purpose. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, – kind of your experience with the boy scouts eagle scouts and, and and your your background there yeah so our mom put us through scouts uh i mean i mean yeah technically she put us through scouts we did it uh <laughs> <laughs> we did it <laughs> but, but uh we we went through scouts i think i was put in when i was eight years old and uh honestly it really kind of started i mean did our first winter camping trip with the scouts and it, it instilled a bunch of different philosophies uh, especially some things that we think about every day in terms of like the mottos and slogans and pretty much laws of be prepared, do a good turn daily, leave no trace, and then pretty much the scout law, which is 13 different amazing traits. So there's this uh, longer backstory to it, but it has really um, allowed us where we each had to do an Eagle Scout project and put hundreds of hours of community service. But uh, yeah, no, it's really set a staple for a lot of different things. I think we got Zan back now. Zan, you there? Yeah, I'm back here. There he is. I got booted real quick. <laughs> Too much excitement on my end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, to continue on the, the Boy Scout things, you guys, um, what was – so besides Boy Scouts and, like, family outings, um, was there any sort of mom – moment or memorable like first trip you guys ever did like solo or like you three you two with wolfie not really so much with wolf wolf was wolf I was mean, a I'm, tad bit younger yeah well, we're really with, with, with thor and i we kind of we bonded through sports obviously and then just like never really having a tv in our yard at our parents house and not TV. <laughs> the tv was not in the yard <laughs> just to make that there was no tv actually at all uh but <laughs> we we built tree forts so thor and i got pretty close wolf's wolf was just a young duck and uh we i mean thor and i went on excursions and did winter camping out at mount rose outside of tahoe and uh different kind of things but i would honestly say that us working together in terms of like teamwork on the eagle scout projects and then it really kind of us being competitive and really trying to set a standard for each one of our things that we did. So if we did an Eagle Scout project of this caliber or if we did a camping trip of this caliber, it was kind of each one of us trying to compete with one another on trying to do a little bit better. So there is this just like inherent competition between the brothers on seeing who could do, who could outperform one another. <laughs> Sibling rivalry. It's great. Yeah. Um, also, like, you guys kind of alluded to this earlier, but, um, you know, through your adventures together, through, like, your years of training and Area 11 and everything like that, um, you know, you guys have done some pretty arduous expeditions together. Has that impacted your relationship with each other? And kind of how has that transformed your relationships? That's a good question. I think that adversity is one of the strongest bond bonding components and. I'm going to actually refer to the story for this one. When Stein and I finished the 16-hour snowmobile drive out to the Adam Fiala and finally decided to set up base camp, is one of those things where we looked at each other and we knew that we needed to set up a tent, boil water, and drink 
water and eat food. And looking at each other as brothers, knowing that we needed to do that, and we were on the same wavelength and knowing what each of us had to do and delineate tasks, we would not have been to that point unless we pushed each other and criticized the work habits and the way that we performed in the field and as humans, unless we were brothers with no filter, being able to do that. I, I tend like to the feel no like, filter yeah. thing is very important. I can be extremely blunt with my brother. Which is great. And I can do the same. I can say it. <laughs> it's fine and the thing yeah. is like at the end of the day we're still brothers and that's what we do and so be able to break down that barrier there's no hard feelings there's just hard lessons that will make you better right and it's just unconditional like competition for sure and love yeah yeah i'm sure you guys definitely got quite a bit of competition between you two especially in the ski realm and everything um, yeah. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you touch on a good point there it's like um that no filter i mean that sometimes i could kind of be you know, hard for some people depending on their relationship and seems like you guys have a really solid cohesive relationship and a common ground understanding of that um, aspect. Yeah. And I would say, honestly, we have similar goals in terms of in like Eric and I, my best friend did a bunch of different like sit down chats and whiteboarded some of our long-term goals and they were like 90, 98% aligned. Uh, and then Thor and I are very aligned in a lot of different things we want to do. So it was kind of that continuation of the process to fulfill some of those long-term goals. And the more experience you have at it and getting to know one another and like we believe in radical transparency. Yeah. So the more you communicate, the more you share, the more we bond as we go through these different really random excursions together. <laughs> Well, it definitely shows between you guys, um, both on like socials and in your videos and just talking to you guys here. Um, to finish up right right now, um, since we're kind of running running towards the end of here, uh, I did want to touch a little bit on your the latest film project you guys worked on at uh, Corcovado in Peru. Um, I understand that was Eric Ropkais and Rafael Pisa's kind of passion project that you guys helped produce. Um, and to get to the base of Corcovado, you guys – you guys, what, you chartered a boat and you had to bushwhack through the jungle with skis on your back. Um, so I've seen some pretty hilarious uh, images of Stein trying to bushwhack and climb up some, some trees in the jungle, uh, grunting away while Thor's laughing at him. But what was, what was bushwhacking through, like, the dense South American jungle with a bunch of ski gear on your back, kind of seeming a little out of place? What was that like? Yeah, and I, just to preface that, yeah, as you mentioned – uh, I got a call from Eric when I was in Norway about this project, and then there was this, like, real random, like, crazy scramble to get down there. But um, it was this amazing uh, project that Eric called us up on about uh, a serious inspiration around watching the movie 180 Degrees South. If you haven't seen it, I would say watch, watch it. it tonight. Um, but it's a really inspiring film about going out and doing what you love. Um, walking through the jungle and – Bushwhacking, you're going through so many different environments. You can see this, fo this photo, your beach got dropped off by a little beach, like by a little boat, a, like a local fisherman boat. You walk, we pretty much rounded this beach and then went up this valley and just like bushwhacked forever. Like, 100, like 150 meters in an hour and then went canyoneering and then pretty much went up the west face and over the north ridge. But this is Thor took this, Thor was the, like the, lead producer on the film and he's carrying this giant dry bag with a bunch of stuff which you could talk about but he took this drone photo of us where you can see three individuals on this uh, it's a volcano uh three individuals here and then eric's just above it too and we skied from the highest point that we could um but it was just raining and it was the wettest i've ever been in my entire life yeah, yeah it, it it definitely <laughs> looked like while you guys were in the jungle you were kind of yeah. getting hit from all ends you know, rain that, that film's coming this summer too so in a couple months that'll be uh launched right on. i'm still i'm stoked to see it and look that that sounds like a super cool trip incorporating a lot of different uh aspects of travel um what was the biggest barrier besides obviously having a bushwhack um for for planning that kind of trip Ah, uh, to, to be completely transparent, I'd have to defer that to Eric. There's only been a, like less than five people who really tried to attempt to summit the thing because it's like 
No, like when when pretty much Eric and Rafa were talking to local fishermen, they're like, what are you doing? Like, why do why you, you want to go there? Me? <laughs> okay, like whatever, just pay us and then go out there. So I prefer to Eric and Rafa on the actual planning of it, but when uh, I know that Thor had a whole different level of preparation for trying to film it because like the Arctic to <laughs> jungle and mountain is very, very unique. Yeah. What do you get plan for that? Well, not so much planning, just showing up with the right gear and having the legs to carry it. You know, I remember putting my <laughs> the shot of Eric. Those were like the first seven steps we took on the beach after getting dropped off. I remember filming that and then putting my backpack on and literally like <laughs> crumbling like, oh, my God. I have to walk to the top of that thing with this on me? And it was just like mind-blowing. But, you know, that's a physical challenge that – we also had a gypsy wagon, if you know what that is. Uh, very much a gypsy <laughs> wagon. Three, three bags. That looks ridiculous. Well, l- luckily you guys uh, just got done training for your polar expedition and everything, so I'm yeah. sure your legs were well fit. Yeah, relatively. What, what about a uh, highlight from your trip? I mean, getting to ski at first ascent on a volcano is pretty – a highlight within itself, but I'm sure there had to be some sort of unique thing that stood out to you. I think – like, I know that sounds almost cliche, but the entire adversity of going through the jungle and finding a path through after two days of heavy rain to standing on that little point on top of the mountain to putting skis on, like, it all accumulates into this really much highlight reel of an expedition that I will remember for my whole life. Yeah, and I, I guess, like, to be succinct, it was the – only nice day of the entire trip probably the only <laughs> it was nice day the whole year was, like it was like crap weather the entire time except for this day we and uh summer. we were up there like yeah like wow we've been blessed and we're up there with the people we're like best friends with so honestly the highlight of the trip was like being able to Just even make right it up there because we didn't know we were going to make it out of the jungle so once we're up there with the people that we we're like really good friends with like that's this is this has been a serious wow. highlight. And the ski down was yeah. rad. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so we're going we're gonna to finish up, guys. Um, you, you both are super inspiring, full of all kinds of wisdom, um, definitely seemingly ahead of your time uh, in, in that aspect. So can you, can you leave our audience um, some advice or words of encouragement uh, on pursuing and executing some sort of large-scale ad- adventure projects that they might have? happily there's okay i'll just talk with a few things i think of every single morning when i wake up one famous like probably the world's most famous all-around explorer mike horn once shared that the world is only as big as you think it is so it's a sheer understanding of like awareness of opportunity you don't know what's out there unless you do your research Uh, another one is you are the average of the five closest people you surround yourself by so surround yourself with individuals that you really want to help create a future with. Um, you all build off one another, compete with one another. So a couple of things that I think of every single day is like, do you learn, grow through like literally being aware of what's out there? And then also surround yourself with people you love and can help push you to do better. I think uh, another nugget for me that I wake up and, inspire you every day i graduated college with the undergrad certificate but every day i wake up and i i tell myself that i am a student trying to learn something new every day if i want to become a storyteller and learn how to work camera then i can figure that out as long as i apply myself and have the ability to be coachable and honestly youtube is really good you can learn a shit ton of stuff on youtube like yeah those be coachable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thanks, guys. Stor, Stein, Thor, you guys are awesome, man. Uh, love talking with you guys all the time. Definitely look forward to seeing what you guys put out in the future here. Um, stoked to be working alongside you guys with Do Good Shit and everything. Uh, everything you guys have been doing is awesome. Um, that's going to be the end of our show. Um, and definitely was an outstanding show and great way to end it. Um, yeah, thanks, guys, for sharing your stories and words of wisdom with us. Uh, all, uh, no doubt, extremely talented individuals and definitely going far. Um, I, I know Marshall said last time he was speaking with you guys, uh, you left him with a, a quote that you're you're building the aircraft while you're flying. Uh, 
<laughs> outstanding definitely yeah. is a testament to your guys is uh <clears throat> to your guys worth it work ethic so i really appreciate you guys for being on the show here what would you think about the show marshall and I, I gotta say like just getting to know you both um over these last these last couple of weeks and getting to chat with you on the phone and dig into to more of the details that we about your lives and everything that you guys have done to date uh I'm going to follow you guys forever, man. It's, you guys really are, are an inspiration. You're inspiring my days. Uh, I wake up with a little more fire now, uh, and I'm excited to see what's coming out in the future for you guys and what all these, these plans you guys got in store. I, I, I got the ultimate faith that, that you guys will do some do good shit, and you're going to do some really, really good things uh, in the, the near future. So uh, for, those, for those on the call, uh, and to kind of close it out, uh, uh, look these guys up, check out their area 11 film on outside TV. I think the YouTube links in the chats, uh, guys, do you guys, what's the best way for those that are listening in to, to get a hold of you, reach out, connect with you guys? Um, what's the best way for that? You can reach out via email. My email is Stein at gmail.com. Uh, phone number five, three, zero. Uh, no, but yeah, no, just, uh, all right. My Instagram's, at Stein Retzloff. Yeah, first, last name, both of us, Instagram. Yeah. All easiest. And then team underscore intrepid. And then you'll see probably the first people that po pop up are like Eric, Repka, Do Good Shit, and Taylor. So that's our whole collective. Cool. Well, I mean, it, you guys, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you for joining us. It's awesome. Thank you. Um, so you keep, keep inspiring and keep, uh, keep living your guys' best life. It's an inspiration to us all. Thank you for tuning into this episode. We appreciate your support and hope you gain some knowledge and inspiration from our guests. If you found value in this episode, have feedback on how we can improve, or if you or someone you know would be a good fit as a future guest, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. That's the end of this episode. Until next time, get out there, get dirty, and go adventure together.